Hey, what's going on guys? Brian with Man's Comics. Welcome to the latest edition of Hot and Cold, where we are covering the hot and coldest comic book market trends of the week. With me as always is my co-host, Jack DeMeo, aka Mr. Bolo. What's going on, buddy? Man, I'll tell you what, Brian. This was a, kind of a rough day in the DeMeo household, but that's the beauty of comics, because no matter what's going on, this type of stuff provides that escape, an escape for so many, and that is why we love covering this stuff right here on the Simple Men's Comics YouTube channel. That's right, we got a great hot and cold list for you tonight, and we're going to get right into it now, starting with the first hot pick from Cover Tunes author Mike Morello. Hey everybody, Mike Morello from CBSI's Cover Tunes with my hot pick this week. And this week, amidst a hurricane of false internet news, we did get some, some pieces of real news, and I think the biggest one is the Riri Williams AI Tony Stark Disney Plus streaming show um, that we're going to get. And I think that... Um, we're already seeing an uptick, especially on Riri's first appearance in Invincible Iron Man number seven. Uh, this book had faltered quite a bit over the last year or so, and it is now back up to 75 or 80 for Raws, which is uh, pretty impressive considering. Um, keep in mind also that uh, the second print, which just changed the color slightly, is, is of course the next printing. But the third printing adds a little circle here that ha actually has Riri on the cover, and so don't sleep on that one. People may want that. There's also the Women of Power variant, which, uh, while it's kind of a lackluster cover, um, it is still pretty sought after in getting uh, a little bit more money. Um, and then, of course, there's the number nine Invincible Iron Man, which is the first time she suits up in the Iron Man armor, so that one could see an uptick as well. It already is seeing a little bit of one. Um, and then, of course, there's the infamous Iron Man number one, which is the first time we see AI Tony Stark and then there's the two Ironheart issues. There's the actual Ironheart number one and the um, Invincible Iron Man reboot number one, which is the Ironheart version. Both of those can be found pretty cheaply still in a lot of bins, as can the infamous Iron Man number one still be found fairly easily. Um, and even that number nine, Invincible Iron Man, uh, first time she suits up, that's pretty easy to find as well. Most people have the number seven on their radar, and that one's not quite as easy to pick up cheap. Um, but you may want to get it now before a trailer drops. Um, I think that Marvel is pretty serious about the Riri character, and I think they're going to um, utilize her quite a bit. So that's my hot pick for the week. Thanks, everybody. Have a good one. So here we're talking Riri Williams. Jack, I don't know if the news has actually been confirmed. I think everyone's citing one source, which is We Got This Covered. I know there's a Fox News article, but they even cited We Got This Covered. I haven't seen any true confirmation yet, but then again... Been busy doing other things in life, so it might have come out. Although not confirmed, I do think this is a direction that Marvel, I mean, it's obvious that Marvel probably head with Riri Williams. Sooner or later, she's going to show up, whether Disney+, Plus, Disney Channel, MCU. But these books, they've kind of been popular since Riri came out with Ironheart. They kind of drifted off into the cold a little bit, but now they're back up being hot, especially that 7, that 9, and of course that Women of Power variant. And then he mentioned the Ironheart books themselves i still love that stephanie hans variant for that but what do you think about this jack yeah so i just did a google search that's why i was looking down uh when you started talking but you know um when i wrote an article for comicbookinvest.com covering this initial news that got out about riri williams and at the time yeah we reacted to a fox news article a closer inspection of that fox news article you could see that they were um sorting we got uh, sourcing we got this covered um, and we don't want to down talk any website, but we got this covered is one of those websites that puts out movie news almost on a daily basis. Um, and most of it's based in rumor and conjecture and only a very small percentage of it has really ever come out to be something that turns out to be legitimate. Um, so I, you know, Fox news ran with it. Um, but if you go in and do a Google search right now, you're getting kind of the same type of websites that, that tend to report on this. So we've got, we got this covered. We've got hypebeast.com, um, which is actually primarily like a sneaker and urban clothing, um, website. Um, you've got cosmic book news who, um, if that's another, we got this covered essentially. So, and if you just go and you Google Riri Williams, you're not getting anything coming up about, um, the, the Disney plus series. You're just getting information about the character, a bleeding cool article about issue number 10 that drops this week. Right. Things usually, like sorry, but usually when stuff like that comes out, deadline, heroic Hollywood variety, all right. those, you see some type of article on there. I haven't seen one on there yet, but no, no, it's a, and that's the thing is, so 
I, I would I would not call this confirmed news. No disrespect to Mike. I just I don't think that this is anything more than ru- rumor. Having said that, that doesn't mean there's not you know smoke where there's fire type thing. Like there could there there could be something coming. And you made some great points. Um, you know when this character was created, we all felt like this was a character that was inevitably going to end up in the MCU, right? I mean, this was just a Brian Michael Bendis creation, um, a natural evolution of Iron Man and Tony Stark. Who didn't, as a comic book reader, when you saw Tony Stark die, immediately have that light bulb go off in your head and go, Riri Williams. I mean, it just it just seems like such a natural progression. Um, but at the same point, um, you know, it's all about how they're going to go about doing this. And we just don't know yet. And, and they've, we've got a slate of Disney pro Plus properties already, right? You know, so, like, we know anything probably coming isn't going to come for a little while. Nonetheless, this pick belongs on the hot list, whether this is a confirmed report or a non-confirmed report, because the reality is it spiked these books. Um, and I think, really, we're going to talk more about this as this episode goes on, but I think that that's a cautionary tale for the community, is, is to be careful Um where the sources of news are coming from uh, because we're seeing a lot in the industry prices rising or dropping based on unconfirmed reports and rumor and speculation especially movie speculation right so it's funny because I, I work in it for my day job and whenever you talk to someone about software and they're like oh well does it do this the key thing a lot of people say is no but that will be in the future release Right now, with comic speculation, it seems like Disney Plus is that future release. So a lot of speculation comes up. is It's going to be in Disney Plus. It's going to be the future release. No doubt. I have more. Like We talked about Moon Girl coming to Disney Channel, and I was just like, blah. But Riri Williams, I'm actually more excited for her to come and get optioned and see, make her make her way over to Disney Plus or whatever it is, then Moon Girl. So I'm really excited about this. But there's no doubt those titles that were mentioned, that Mike mentioned, were hot. Cooled down, got hot back again, and now we're seeing them spike once once more. So Yeah, and, and another thing is that, that um, AI Tony Stark has been affected by all of this and the infamous Iron Man, um, who I don't think you can do Rhee Re- Williams without that, um, that version of Tony Stark. So... Um, you know, we're definitely seeing spikes there as well, which I think really fit into the category of Riri Williams because they're getting hot because of Riri Williams. Right. The other thing is, look, I think that's the big selling point of Robert Downey Jr. returning as the voice of the AI. But how much money, you're talking about a Disney Plus show. Right. Is it going to be a limited series, like where it's going to be like certain episodes and then it's done? Or are they going to carry on at some point? I don't see Robert Downey Jr., they got to be paying the man a hefty amount of money to do a voiceover work for an AI. So I'd be anxious to see how that works out. And if it does play out and that show actually comes to Disney+. Plus. But no doubt, those books are hot right now. Absolutely. And we're going to move right on into our next hot pick this week, which, which comes from the dollar bin digging author on comicbookinvest.com, Peter Renna. What's going on, everybody? This is Peter Renna bringing you my hot pick this week. And while I'm not the biggest fan of this pick, it had to be done. Because I can't deny that Batwing has been selling. It's mostly issues 19 and 20, which are the first appearance. Luke Fox, who a lot of people are speculating will be an upcoming black Batman. But, uh, I don't know. I still have to caution you against investing too much in this. There's 50 copies up right now. And uh, buy it nows are anywhere from $50 to $160. Uh, the highest sold on this book in the last week was a best offer on a $150 ask. So who knows what it actually ended up as. But most copies have been selling in that $50 range. This was a $10 book back in June. But this uh, current speculation has the prices really going up. But now they're actually starting to trend a little bit more down. Uh, sets of 19 and 20, uh, two sets sold today, one for 70, one for 90. Whereas they're still asking prices, looking for 200 for the pair. And 20 is also doing, you know, 20 to $50 on its own. But I would really caution you from investing too much in this. I mean... So this wouldn't be the first time somebody else has been Batman. I mean, yeah, Dick Grayson has been Batman. Tim Drake has been Batman. Jean-Paul Valley, Azrael has been Batman. Damian Wayne is going to be Batman at some point. Thomas Wayne has been Batman before. 
Commissioner Gordon has even been Batman. And while some of those books do a little bit, it's a short-term story. It's not going to last, so don't invest too much in it. Plus, there's no guarantees it's going to be Luke Fox as it is. There's been no formal announcement, so it, it could be Black Lightning. Even though Bleeding Cool said it's not going to be Duke Thomas, still wouldn't sleep on it. You never know. I mean, I don't trust the rumor as it is, so why not spend a couple of bucks and grab yourself a first Duke Thomas and Batman 21? So, as I said, I'm not the biggest fan of that spec, so please be cautious. But it had to be said that that book has been hot the last week. So there we have Peter talking about Batwing, and no doubt that is hot, but I totally agree with him. And if people are paying, what is it? Does he take two, did he say 200 for the set? Yeah, he said 200 for the set. Yeah, freaking bonkers. I mean, and exactly on what he just said. It's based on rumor. Everyone, I mean, speculation is speculation, and that's what speculation is. So people are going crazy for cuckoo puffs over these freaking Batwing comics right now. I'm not chasing them. I'm not hunting them. But if it's Duke Thomas, then I'm ready because I just bought Duke Thomas books back in the day when they were super cheap. Either way, no doubt, these books are hot. They're moving the market right now. You're seeing a lot of sales, just like he mentioned on his video. But what do you think about this pick, Jack? Well, you know, it's funny. We just talked about rumor speculation, most of it being from, like, the movie side. But this is another pick. Like I said, it's going to be the theme of today's show in a lot of ways. Um you got to read the Bleeding Cool articles. I think there's a lot of headline chasing. A lot of people read those headlines and then they run. Um, the first article that came out essentially just said that rumor at conventions from people who may know something say that DC wants to do a black Batman in 2020 leading into 2021. That was literally all the information. Then they speculated on several characters who they believed it could be. They talked about, like you said, Black Lightning. Talked about... Duke Thomas talked about Luke Fox, um, talked about a character who I can't remember his name, but Tom King created who is like rescued by Batman and Wonder Woman, um, who, you know, could be a possibility. And it, they really just kind of threw it out there. Suddenly a second article comes out on Bleeding Cool. And again, I'm not taking any shots at Bleeding Cool, but they were then reacting to the market because everybody seemed to jump on Luke Fox. And the important thing when you read these articles is they hint that DC hasn't even decided this yet. This isn't something that, this isn't like DC made a decision and now information's being leaked out and we're all trying to guess who. Not only are we trying to guess who, we don't even know if this is actually going to be done or if it's just rumor. And if it is done, DC hasn't made up their mind of who they're going to do this with. There's talks about multiple writers writing it, whether it's Brian Michael Bendis. And here's the other thing. They mentioned that they could create a character to play this this black Batman. So I don't agree that with the idea that this will be kind of like in the vein of Damien or all these other characters who have been Batman because they were Batman for like a short period of time. We knew there was a shelf life on it. Um, let's be honest. If they do some sort of Elseworld story, this could be Miles Morales big. I, I could see that if you do it right. Um, but where this gets nuts is the prices that are being paid even on the low end even like with the gluttony of copies that have hit ebay people paying fifty dollars i still think that's way too much i mean if if i had that book for say ten dollars which is what was going for if i had bought that for 10 and i could sell it for 50 i'd be thrilled right so i'd be looking to sell and 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 make five times my money and feel good about that as an roi if you're buying it for 50 you gotta ask yourself what do you expect this book to sell for? I can't ever see it going more than that high point of like 100. Um, and that would have to be if you're right about the spec. God forbid you're wrong about the spec, you're stuck. And you know the saddest thing about this is, Brian? Luke Fox speculation should be legit right now because Luke Fox is coming to the CW in the Batwoman TV show. And that hasn't been talked about at all. We're actually going to get a televised adaptation of Luke Fox's Batwing which should be reason for us to be excited about Luke Fox and about Batwing. And Luke Fox is a cool character. Like, if you haven't read anything of Luke Fox, you should do that. If you haven't checked out, there's a uh, Batman animated movie. I know somebody's going to get it in the chat. I'm drawing a blank on the name that really tells the story of Luke Fox's ascension into Batwing. Great movie. Um, I, I can't advocate enough how cool of a character he is. That's not my point here. My point is the danger and sinking high dollars into something. Like, if you had Riri Williams books and you're flipping them, great. If you bought Luke Fox cheap and you're flipping them, great. 
more power to you. Who cares why books are spiking if you're looking to sell? But if you're buying in at these high prices based on really unsubstantiated rumors, um, I'm not saying Bleeding Cool is making this up, but Bleeding Cool is having a conversation with dealers who say that this is the rumor, but you don't know where their source is. And that's the thing that we, we see so much happening in this industry is there's so many sourcing issues. And, um, you know, we talked about this on the Volo show last week when I actually made an error on something and it came from a source. And that source was CBR, which is considered one of the strongest news sources in our industry. So you just got to be careful with this stuff. It's, it's very it's very difficult. It's very tricky. But since we have Peter Renna, the author of Dollar Bin Digging, making this pick, I'm going to throw out a Dollar Bin Luke Fox book. All-Star Westerns 21, volume three from the New 52. It is actually the third appearance after that uh, Batwing 19 and 20. So everyone's chasing Batwing 19 and 20. This All-Star Westerns book, it's got it's got the Jonah Hex trade dress. It was his part of that story. And uh, Batwing is featured in that book and on the cover. And, and that is a completely under-the-radar appearance right now. It's not going for anything. But you got to ask yourself, how much was All Star Western printed? Like, how how heavy was that of a series? How many how many shops do you think were even ordering All Star Western? Let alone ordering copies. There's no variance to it. Um, you just got to cover A. But that's something I would be on the lookout for because if Luke Fox spec is legit, then that is a low printed uh, third appearance or second appearance if you don't count the cameo. You know I hate that messy stuff. But either way. For our community, Simpleman's Comics family, we just want to caution you guys, don't buy up the ladder. We tell you guys that all the time. If you can get in cheap, get in on the ground floor, absolutely. If you can't, don't get the FOMO, don't chase. Everything is cyclical. And even if this is going to happen, it's not going to happen until 2020. If you don't think by like November or December these books will be dropping down, you probably haven't seen the cycle enough. So just pay attention and uh, make smart buys. Yeah, so thanks for that pick, Peter. And we're going to go right into our next hot pick, which comes from Simple Man's Patreon member, as well as his own YouTube channel. And we're talking about Comic Man Andy. Oh, I'm back, baby. It's Comic Man Andy. Coming at you from the Comic Man Andy Comic Cave Comic Command Center. Say that five times fast. Brian, Jack, thanks for the invite. I appreciate it. I'm honored. Love being here. It's always a good time. And I love talking spec with you guys. So... I'm here with a hot pick this week, and my hot pick is going to be first solo titles of some major characters. Um, and why is that? Uh, well, let's look at first appearances and second appearances, the prices of some of those characters. Um, for example, we all know, a lot of us know, if you don't know, I'm about to teach you, uh, I'm a major Punisher fan, and ASM 129, the first appearance is way out of my budget. Um, without a lot of work. So what do I chase? I chase the first solo title and I chase second appearance sometimes, but I'm here to talk about first solo title. And this is something I chase and it's a relatively inexpensive book compared to a lot of the other stuff. I think it's hot because like a lot of other people, I've got a budget. And when you're on a budget, you buy what you like so that you like what you buy and uh, you stick with it. Let's talk about Venom. You know, ASM 300, that's out of a lot of people's price range. So you buy Venom Lethal Protector. That's a pretty inexpensive book, inexpensive book right now um, for a first solo title. And why do I think these are hot oh, and going to be getting hotter yet? Uh, is look at Moon Knight with the spec news coming out. Look at Blade with the spec news that came out last month. We saw Tomb of Dracula skyrocket and priced a ton of people out. And in response to that, where did they go? Jumping right out of a dollar bin to a $35 book. Saw sales of this book for up to $65. Um, and it just kept going for a bit there. It's settling in a little bit around a $20 book, but we even saw a 9.8 go for $135 last month, middle of last month. So that's where I think um, a lot of people go when they get priced out of first appearances. Some of the other major stuff is they go for first solo titles of these books. Uh, Jack, Brian, maybe you can help me out with some of the DC side of things. But that's my hot pick for the week. Thanks, guys. Peggy's out. 
So Jack, there we have Comic Man Andy. First of all, I want to say awesome t-shirt. And if you're looking for a t-shirt like that, you can go to simplemanscomics.com forward slash merch and get yourself one of those t-shirts. But he's talking about first solo titled series, right, Jack? Right. And he brought up a lot of good examples. There's some other ones that I bought back in the day because I couldn't afford, say, I got like this Thor 126 because I couldn't afford a Journey into Mystery 83 at the time as I get the glare all over the place. But this was the first so solo titled Thor series. And then, of course, I also can't pick up Incredible Hulk number one willy-nilly. So I got the Hulk 102, which is the first self-titled series for Hulk. But there's no doubt a lot of people chase these. They gain heat, especially because they can't afford the original titles of the first appearance. But what do you think about this pick, Jack? Well, Brian, I'll tell you, I love this pick. To me, this is a very astute pick. This is something that is a real trend in the market, but isn't always something that has been going on for a long time as far as, like, heat. Um, I, I mentioned this on the channel when we were doing the Hot 10 video and we first covered that Blade number 1. When the Netflix series came out, I made a similar spec play. I remember grabbing that 1998 Daredevil number 1. I remember grabbing um, Iron Fist number ones, Luke Cage number ones. And my thought was, well, these are expensive first appearances. And there's so many new speculators coming into the market who can't afford those books. Maybe they will want these books. And honestly, I made no money. I probably still have those books sitting in boxes over here. And I kind of shied away from that spec play. And the one constant, and you and I have talked about this, that seemed to sell of all of those types of books was that Moon Knight number one from 1980 with the Bill Sienkiewicz run. And no doubt right now with the Moon Knight show coming to Disney Plus, that book is hot, red hot. And it's real funny because it seems like there is a serious trend here. And I think Andy's on to something. Um, we see the Blade book, of course, being in great demand. Um, he mentioned Punisher. Um, let me tell you another one that gets slept on. Yes, it was printed 90 million copies. Um, but go to a convention, put this book out. Um, one of my comic OGs taught me this. He said this book will always sell. And that's Spider-Man number one from the Todd McFarlane um, series. It, people always want that book. New collectors, it's one of those books that we all take for granted because we all have them. We all have that book and we all have that X-Men number one, that Jim Lee book. So because we all have it and we know that it's highly printed and it's not worth a ton of money, um, we tend to down read that book but here's the reality like new collectors when they get into the hobby they have to have that book and they're willing to pay money that is makes it very profitable for what a seasoned speculator can find that book for especially in quantity and then and, and if with spider-man number one especially those variants on that book but i think this is something that's going to continue brian i think we're going to see this because you and i have talked about some of the this brings up some other trends like speculators are getting younger which is changing the amount of like accessible income they have which means that certain books of a certain value tend to get kind of hot quicker um and i think that this is going to be something that we may see continue and i think it was a spec play i shied off of for a while because i got burnt with iron fist and luke cage and all of those characters that i mentioned but it's one i may start really re-looking into um like I said, I've always done well with Spider-Man. I've always done well with X-Men. Um, another one is Spider-Man 2099. Has always That number one has always done well. Um, but we're talking $10 to $15 books. Um, but I think for the first time, you have some real potential with some of these books where the first appearance is, is like you said, like you mentioned, the journey into mystery, um, where if the first appearance is several hundred to several thousand, you have a real opportunity to get that number one and market that as a book that somebody's going to really, really want because they won't be able to afford for any time soon that number one, if people are big into, or that first appearance, people are big into placeholders these days, meaning I'll get this book and I'll flip my way up to that next book. Or I'll, it's the same reason why we talked about um, Mike Morello's pick a couple weeks ago of mid-grade books being hot um, because people just, they want to get, the books they want but if they can't get them in the condition they want or they can't get the exact issue they want they're willing to get something to hold them over until then 
And I think that this is a trend we could see continuous one we got to pay attention to. And as some of these characters get announced for various shows and movies, I think the very first thing you have to do if you feel like that first appearance is out of your price range is to start looking at other, though that number one. And, and some of them it hasn't applied to. So it's been interesting, like Falcon number one. We haven't seen Falcon number one take off. Um, you know, there's a bunch that are like that. Winter Soldier number one. Um, are these spec plays waiting to pop? Or, or, or is it just specific? You saw you saw a short pop with Falcon number one when um, was it Civil War? Yeah, when Civil War came out, you saw that miniseries pop a little bit, and then drop right back down. Because yeah, I still have some sitting sitting in a short box. I I wonder about Vision and Scarlet Witch. Those miniseries, yeah. you know, could could those number ones or the series in general pop with the Wanda Vision show? Um, you know, it's time's gonna tell. The great thing is the buy-ins for these number ones that we're talking about. How cheap are they? I mean, you showed some more expensive ones, right. and there's definitely some more expensive plays you can make with it. But a lot of these number ones, like when you were buying that Blade book that Andy showed, people were buying that Blade book for a dollar or three dollars. So if you were grabbing that, it's really low risk play, you know, at the very least. And the funny thing is, while I may not have made my money on the Daredevil and the Luke Cage stuff, they the books do still sell for me. They just don't profit for me. But it's not like I'm losing my ass on it. You know, it's it's still. You know, that Kevin Smith Daredevil people still want. It's just that I thought that my $5 purchase might turn into a $40 purchase, and it didn't play out that way. So thanks, Andy, for that pick. We're going to move around to the next hot pick, which comes from CBS High Presents Tales from the Flip Side podcast member, Brian McClay. What's up, everybody? Brian McClay from CBS High Presents Tales from the Flip Side. I'm here to give my hot pick this week, which is Tank Girl. Recent casting news has Margot Robbie to slot it in to star in the new Tank Girl movie. So this Jamie Hewlett and created character is on the rise. Uh, same Jamie Hewlett that helped create the look and animation of the supergroup The Gorillas. This deadline number one from 1988 published in the UK. Magazine size, very tough to find, just as tough to find a bag and board that will hold it. If anybody knows any bags and boards out there that fit these deadline size, warrior size magazines without having to make crazy alterations, let me know. I'd love it. Um, also, if you're a creative first hunter like me, be on the lookout. I'm not sure if it's out there. I've heard about rumors of it being out there, but Jamie Hewlett and his co-creator of Tank Girl, Alan Martin, met while doing a fancy slash comic in college called Adam Tan. Not Adam Man, Adam Tan. And uh, there was an ad in there for Tank Girl that they did before Deadline. So if you're a creator first hunter like me, try and find that one. And if you do, let me know. Also, there was a Dark Horse book that was um, published in 1991, the famous Rocket issue. You guys know what I mean. There's also some pretty cool variants out there that you can be hunting for. Be on the lookout for anything Tank Girl. A, Margot Robbie, can't go wrong. Later. So here we have Brian McClay talking about Tank Girl recently. News recently hit. Margot Robbie has bought up production rights to make a new Tank Girl movie. But Brian brought some excellent examples, especially of those Deadline magazines. And then we saw some of the cover art, especially the cover art was hot recently with some of those new Titan comics that had like Tank Girl All-Stars. I'm going to be upfront and honest. I don't know too much about Tank Girl. I don't care too much about Tank Girl. When I see Tank Girl, I think of that crappy, was it Lori Petty? What's her name? Lori Petty movie from League of Their Own? Yeah, and yeah. At the time, I didn't know the movie was based on a comic book. I just thought it was a crappy movie. But it's back again. It's hot right now. People are out there buying up those issues. And Brian had excellent examples of books that people are on the hunt for. What do you think, Jack? We are in full transparency, which we talk about on this channel, being of uh, most importance. I don't know anything about Tank Girl either. It's always been something that's existed in the, in the market. Um, I, I, you know, I paid attention to it, but it's never been something that um, has been my kind of spec play. And it's funny, every like three or four years, Tank Girl seems to spike with some sort of news. Um, Obviously, when you look at Margot Robbie, she looks like she'd be perfect to play the lead role of this. And she certainly has star power. But I'm going to bring something up. Like, you always got to be careful when these celebrity um, production companies purchase the rights to these movies. Because 
they seem to not follow through quite as often as, you know, say if Sony itself bought this or something like that, where now they're invested, they've got shareholders to um, kind of, you know, impress and, and, and stay true to if they've spent money. Um, celebrities can throw money around all the time. I think a few years ago, what was it like Brad Pitt and Angelina Jolie uh, put money into um, – um, was it witches? You've got Reb Wilson uh, putting money into Crowded. Um, you know, we've seen these types of things before, but we have yet to see them kind of turn into like final finished products. And I just think that these artists, they grab these things that they feel they believe in, these properties that they like. I think they have the best of intentions, but the execution hasn't always kind of come together. Um, doesn't mean that this one won't doesn't mean anything at all just you know again full transparency um i don't know anything personally about tank girl as far as whether or not i believe that it's a solid spec play but i do know that i tend to get turned off by the idea of this celebrity purchased the rights to this comic i would rather see um a known production company go into development for a a comic in and of itself right I mean, there's no doubt. There's it's it's the new cycle of the week. People are out there hunting those books up. But I want to say, say a movie does get made. Is it going to be one of those movies that once it comes and goes is really going to move the needle on those books still? Or are those books just going to sit in someone's? You know, I see it. I see it as like another um, Road to Perdition, Thirty Days of Night. You know, one of those type books that comes and goes and then. But bring more recent, The Kitchen. Yeah. The Kitchen was a movie I was really excited for, but, I mean, the book now is selling for $3 on eBay. Um, just didn't seem to move the needle at all. Right. But I will give that this Tank Girl does seem to have more of a, uh, I don't want to say cult-like following, but has more of a following than some of those other books that we mentioned. So, time will tell. Um, but me, personally, I don't give two, two poops. But it is hot. I will get. I will say that yeah. it does deserve to be on the list. Yeah, that's the state of movie speculation. As soon as you hear that movie uh, announcement, these yeah. books, especially with someone up. like Margot Robbie tied to it, so right, right. But, that's Harley Quinn herself. Yes. You say Harley Quinn, I say Wolf of Wall Street, but I digress. Um, <laughs> but that was great pick. Also, make sure you guys check out Brian McClay on Tales from Flipside. Every Monday night, 9.30. Plus, he's on Friday nights now on the Tales from Flipside channel. They are doing the new CBSI Hot 10 show. So make sure you check them out. It's got the Hot 10 author himself, Ben Steiniger, on there. So make sure you guys check them out. Next one that we're going to talk about hot this week. We didn't have someone pick it, but we're going to talk about it, right? Yes, yes. We're going to bring it up anyways. So one thing that's hot right now in comic market is Nova. That yeah, Nova is selling like I don't know hotcakes. I guess yes. maybe over to use an overused term. Um, you're seeing random issues. You're seeing um, that Nova number one spiking, which we've talked about that book before. I think we even had it on the hot list. We before. did have it on the hot list before. You know that Nova number one always has its moments where it spikes. Um, it's the most obvious anticipation of people expecting it to become. Besides Adam uh, Warlock, right. Right, but that's more. That's even more obvious because that we know has to be coming because of Guardians of the Galaxy Two. Nova, I guess you know Nova Two because Nova Corps have already been introduced. But um, you know, everybody's waiting on that Richard Rider appearance. Um, everybody's been speculating on it, and there is more rumors. But again, this is something that we have to bring up. This is another rumor that is moving books on the market. But it comes from um, the Lords of the Long Box YouTube channel. That's where most people are citing it, because you got to look and you got to say, well, you got to see where the, this whole kind of like chain of news is going on. It's coming from the Lords of the Long Box YouTube channel. It's being covered by Cosmic Book News, which again is a Cosmic Book News is another news site similar to We Got This Covered. I don't think that they have any sort of entrenchment into the Hollywood system. They're literally just reporting rumors that they hear on other rumor sites. Um, they're report and they've reported on several of Lords of the Long Box stories. And Lords of the Long Box, they're using a Facebook um, group 
I don't know, owner. He runs a Facebook group, uh, Mikey Sutton. So that's where there is coming from. So all of this comes from one guy who claims to have sources. Now, does he have sources? He may, um, but he may not. And it may just be rumor. And we really don't know. But the bottom line is this isn't a, a piece of news that's been picked up by major news sources, which means that those major news sources, I promise you they're aware of this rumor, but it means that they can't corroborate anything that they're hearing here. So I do I think that Nova is solid speculation, a no-brainer to show up in the MCU, without a doubt, without a doubt. You're not going to – this isn't a situation like some of the other ones, like maybe Luke Fox, where you're going to run the risk of losing your ass by making this speculation play. I think you're pretty safe. Having said that, our goal is to buy low and sell high. We're seeing a spike maybe unnaturally early for this one. So if you're jumping on this right now, you you may still make money, but you may not make the money that you could. And this it just goes to the cautionary tale that Brad and I have been talking about, kind of the theme of this episode is to be careful with these movie rumors. Make sure that you're getting your information from <coughs> – excuse me. Make sure you're getting your information from legit news sources that have verified with multiple sources um, and who have a track record. Uh, predicting something, like, say, predicting that Fox and Disney are going to do a deal, that doesn't mean that you then get carte blanche to make any other prediction because, Brad, who didn't predict that? Who didn't see that eventually happening as the X-Men slate of movies began to struggle? Um, that was a natural cause. And it's important to notice that they didn't do a deal. Fox ended up being sold to Disney. So that's it ended up being a whole different route. Um, so there's a difference between speculation and sourcing. And a lot of people speculate, but use sourcing as their um, the word that they use because it gives them a little bit more legitimacy. And as two, Brian and I are two individuals who actually, not, not, not in an attempt to brag, but just being very honest, we have a few contacts um, in the Hollywood kind of hemisphere. And one thing that I know, Brian, you can, you know, comment on, but protecting those sources becomes of the utmost importance. So I'm always skeptical when people are, you know, kind of outward about rumors and things. I was told about the Black Widow movie two years before it was announced, but I would have had to burn a bridge to go and report on that. So that wasn't something I was going to do. Um, you know, that's kind of that's kind of the way in which we handle a lot of these things. Right. I agree with Jack. I mean, even the sources we do have, um, they might tell us information, but a lot of times they say a lot of times the source will tell us, hey, you, you know, you guys can't let anyone know about this or, hey, this this is coming out next week. But even then, um, a lot of times. I just try to err on the safe side and I don't say anything because that way I don't get my butt in a sling and don't get anyone else in trouble. Um, so either yeah, way, we try to, we'll try to tease things. So that's where you guys get on us sometimes about teasing things. You know, we'll say like, you know, you know, you want to pay attention to this book. You know, there's a lot of talk about this book um, and we'll, we'll do what we can uh, to let the community know that we're hearing something. But um, you know, we want to make sure we protect those relationships. So that's something we always watch out for. So if you do hear us teasing like that, know that we, there's probably something we know. Right. And I'll be the first one to tell you that I make mistakes. So sometimes things I say are not correct. And I usually admit when I make mistakes. Right. And a lot of times when our sources tell us things, they'll tell us that it's still a fluid situation. So just because they're hearing one thing is going to happen doesn't mean it's going to ultimately end up happening. And it's very dangerous for us to get on a microphone. And I'm not bashing uh, Lords of the Long Box or anyone. Um, it just, it, it, it's the culture that we're living in where people want to break these news stories. And um, it, I don't necessarily blame the, the news people who try to do that. It's just that we have to look out as a community. So that's why I'm only speaking to our community. If you watch us and you try to get speculation and investing advice from us my advice is to be careful running out and buying every time you hear a talking head us included um talking about a rumor if it's not something that you're finding if you can't google search and find reputable major news sources corroborating that story 
then you have to ask yourself, how does this person know something that these people don't? And if this person could get that information, these people would probably hire them. Right. So that's, you know, something to be careful for. With that being said, our next hot pick this week is going to come from me. We have some people on the DL this week, so we're kind of short on the hot picks. So I'm going to give a hot pick. It's been on this list probably, what, a couple weeks ago. We had a guest picker, Thaddeus, yes. give this guest pick. But it's still hot. And we figured it was still relevant. And we're talking about Boom Studios. Boom Studios still hot with Once a Future. Boom Studios is still hot with Something is Killing the Children. Boom Studios is hot. They got Final Order cut off right now with, um, what is it, Skies Over East Berlin? Right, right. That's the next one. So that one, we Brett, we had a chance to read an advanced copy of it. it we don't think it's going to have as much hype as Once in Future and Something is Killing Children, but it is still a great story. But Boom is putting out quality content, and right now they're masters of marketing. You can say what you want, but they're hot. Some people hate how they have second and third and fourth prints already in the queue before the first issue comes out. And then you're saying, well, I'm seeing the first print of the copy sitting there on the, on the shelf still, but the second and third prints are selling out. Whether right or wrong, all I'm saying is Boom Studios is hot right now, and it's and why it's on this list. But what do you think about it, Jack? Yeah, well, it's undeniable they're hot. Um, the reality is people may not like um, their distribution strategy, but you can't deny that it's worked. Um, it's a marketing plan that has paid off. Um, I, I, you know, We talk about a room saying the VP of marketing. I don't know if this was all his doing or Ross Ritchie or who was the one that's behind this, but... You know, it, it the reality is it's a home run. Um, people are upset because there's an, like an entitlement feeling where you feel like you should be able to get everything. And um, unfortunately, when you have a limited collectible and everybody wants it, um, and people want it for different reasons, they want it for collecting, they want it for speculating, they want it for flipping. There's going to be you know a demand that outweighs the supply. And if it was so easy to get, we probably wouldn't even be talking about it right now. Um, you know. Typically, later printings are done just for um, the purposes of readers. And so you mentioned, like, you know, why are they doing second and third printings when first printings are still, you know, plentiful? And the reality is they're looking at later printings differently than it seems like other companies are. Other companies are coming out with late printings to supplement the reader market. Boom Studios is coming out with late printings to create essentially rare variants. They're well, creating... Not to mention, also, they might be sitting on the shelves at your LCS, but they're sold out at the distributor. That's why they also have other printings right. going on. Right. And that's that's when they decide to print up more, is when the distributor cannot get more. And again, we talk about the regionality. So if your comic book store in New York City still has 50 copies of Once in Future Number 1 first print, but mine down in Rock Hill, South Carolina, can't get them. And mine is calling up Diamond like, I need Once in Future. And, you know, in... Poughkeepsie, they're calling for Once in Future. And in Des Moines, Iowa, Des Moines, Iowa, they're calling for Once in Future. And so on and so forth. Guess what? Boom Studios gets that notification from Diamond. That, you know, there's demand for this. And then that's when those late printings come up. And you also got to remember, you, gotta, you can't have it both ways. If you're mad because these books are coming out prior to the first print, then you can't be mad when the first prints are sitting on the shelves because you got to remember that they were creating and soliciting these a lot of these printings before those books hit shelves when they didn't know what the sellout would be on them. So, um, and I think the only reason why we're seeing first prints sit in some ways is because people kind of move on to that next one. Like, okay, I got the first print. Now I'm focused on the second print. Now I'm focused on the third print. You would see those first prints would be dry up and be gone if the second, third, fourth print was the exact same cover art. Exactly. Exactly. Nobody would want those late printings. We'd see the late printings sitting on the shelves, and um, and those first prints would be absolutely gone. And that's why I think people are like looking at this wrong. If your first prints are still available in shops, you should be grabbing them because they're already profitable on both Something is Killing the Children and Once in Future. And they have so much room for growth just based on how traditionally the market kind of favors first prints. Right, and not 
we take let's take once in future and we'll take something that's killing the children out of the equation they're still hot over just the amount of stories the, the content that they're putting out i mean you got angel you got buffy you got go go power rangers you got mighty Morphin power rangers look at the stuff they've done in the past with sons of anarchy uh, right. sisters of sorrow their licensed their licensed comics and their creator own content always have great stories um they have what is it the what's that other imprint the archaea or whatever yep. that i mean they got uh, Kaboom. dark dark crystals age of resistance that's coming out which is also that huge netflix show that we sat and that sat and talked about how great that series was so no doubt once in future and something's killing children's on everyone's radar right now but there's a bunch of great content coming from boom studios yeah w without a doubt um you know and, and they're on fire with creator own that's what everyone's talking about their bread and butter has been those licensed properties and now you're seeing a great product mix and as one product gets hot it tends to have that trickle down effect where more people are paying attention to boom studios now because of those kind of landmark um you know uh creator owned properties and it's again it's only a matter of time before we start seeing announcements for um optioning for right. things like once in future something's killing the children and bone parish yep and it speaks to it when you see mini series get picked up into ongoing so yes but. so that's going to wrap up the hot list for this week and we're we'll right into the cold list with the first pick coming from mike morello hey everybody Mike Morello back with my cold pick this week, and this week I'm going with run filler, um, especially Silver Age run filler. Um, what's interesting is that every time a new piece of news hits, we seem to all go rabid for these sort of obscure keys that we either weren't aware of or we thought, oh, we can get those some other time if they ever become a thing. But now the way that the market is, when these issues pop, they don't just go up 10, 20 bucks, they go up into hundreds, sometimes thousands of dollars, especially if they're rare and they're Silver Age. Um, and so I think if there's a series that you've latched onto, say it's X-Men or say it's Daredevil or Fantastic Four, I would say do your best to try to get yourself these run fillers cheap because, I, I mean, almost every character seems like it's going to get used in some movie or TV show eventually. And wouldn't it be nice to just have those sitting in a long box ready to go? And there is still something to be said for reading comics. And, I mean, I know I still read my favorites. I love to have those run fillers cheap. I certainly don't want to pay a premium for them. And, I mean, right now those run fillers are pretty cheap to get, even the Silver and Bronze Age ones. Um, so, for now, they're my cold pick because I think it's a good buying opportunity before some of these turn into keys. We've seen it already with books like Red Guardian, um, some of these Black Knight books that you could have had for 5 10 15 20 bucks, even in good shape, say, a couple of years ago, and now you're talking hundreds of dollars for these books that nobody cared about before. Um, so keep those in mind. Um, I think that they are cold for now, but a lot of them will be hot over the next few years, depending on what we see in phases 4, 5, 6, 12, 100, however many phases we get. Um, run filler. Cold for now. That's my cold pick. Thanks, everybody. Cool Mike Morello with his cold pick talking about run filler. He was also talking specifically or directing more at Silver Age run filler. But we could take that and we can apply it now where it is cold. Huge upside with the buying opportunities. And for example, look at freaking Batwing. Eight his issues right there. Before that, yeah, they were you know somewhat key issues, but no one really was buying them up there. Like you said, it was ten dollar, five dollar book. A lot of people had them in there as run fillers. Look at Thor, God of Thunder with that Jason Aaron run that those some of those issues is picked up in. A lot of those at one time were run filler. So you never know. You pick up these run fillers. They're cold picks. We always say buy what you like, collect what you like. But you never know when you're collecting in that run. Some of these books might pop pop off down the road. Either way, it is a cool pick because a lot of people, it's kind of like collecting baseball cards back in the day where you wanted a complete set and you had your, your, your major cards and then you had your commons and the Beckett price was like five cents with a down arrow. But what do you say about this, Jack? Well, I think it's, it's a great comparison to make the sports cards because we've seen the same um, trend in sports cards. I used to manage a sports card store for several years and um, <clears throat> the owners of the shop, they had a hard time transitioning from their bread and butter of selling you know tons of commons to fill sets to like the new wave of i want this rookie card i want this 
memorabilia card, et cetera, et cetera. The same we're seeing in comics. Um, when you know, when I was a kid, people were building those ASM runs. People were building those Thor runs. That was important to people. Uh, and not to say before we get commenters going, oh, I still do that. No, there's still there's still a market of people that do that. The problem is that market is shrinking and shrinking by the day. Part of it is technology. Um, part of it is the spiking of books. So because books spike, um, people get addicted to that feeling of like, oh, I bought this for this and it's worth this. We all do as speculators. Um, I'll be the first one to admit I don't pay any attention to run filler books. Um, it's not that's not my thing. It hasn't been my thing really ever. Um, I'm not a completionist. That's not really my style. Um, so it's never been something I pay attention to. Um, but we're seeing that more and more. The advent of the key collector app, I also think, has a big, big thing to do with it because people can go right in with the key collector app and look at all of the, the you know, supposed keys in, in a series. And you're seeing more and more of these younger speculators. They're only focusing on those books. So retailers are happening to try to find more creative ways to sell the run fillers. So you're seeing more like mystery mail call type boxes. You're seeing um, more dollar bins. You go to conventions now, there's dollar bins everywhere. When you didn't see that quite as prevalent back then. Um, but yes, there's a lot of buying opportunities because like what Brian said, um, today's run filler can be tomorrow's key issue. Uh, you know, Gore the God Butcher and that that um, Thor got a Thunder Run that you mentioned, Brian, is probably the most prevalent one that comes to mind in my mind over the last few years of a series where I literally went into my own convention dollar stock after someone bought one. And I was like, wait, wait, what, what was in there? And then had to pull out a bunch of them. And, you know, here I'm supposed to be, you know, a CVSI guy. I'm supposed to, you know, know this stuff. And it caught me slipping so you know i had to go back in there and pull those out um it's just funny the way that works devil hulk was another one that that hulk 12 and 13 um that was another one that got past people for a long time but you know um i think that run filler is going to continue to be cold i mentioned to you before we went on the air to talk about this you could almost put this as a cold pick every week because it's just the trend of the market and the trend of the hobby is moving away from these um maybe great stories but you can now and another reason is you can buy them when i said the technology I, that's not all about like the key collector app it's also you can buy trades which wasn't really a huge option when this we were talking silver age um it wasn't an option at all and we, now you have digital um unfortunately you have bootleg sites so you're seeing more and more creative ways for people to read comics and they don't feel the need to go and spend four dollars and rising that's another thing rising cost of issues at the lcs so they don't feel the need to go spend four and five dollars on individual issues that aren't going to be key issues that aren't issues that they feel like are going to be um, major books to pay attention to um and there are outliers because we talk about selling in this run selling in sets being you know profitable way to sell it's one of the major reasons for the reader buzz section you know, there's certainly runs like Venom and Immortal Hulk and things like that where you can make some money on some of those, you know, grouping of issues. But on the whole, it's definitely cold, whether you're talking Silver Age, Modern Age, doesn't really matter. Um, you see a lot of those books sitting. And when you go to a lot of dealers tables and you start flipping through Silver Age boxes, you'll start to see like mostly all run fillers because those those keys are on the wall. Um, so that kind of becomes a trend and and there's almost this feeling now they don't have anything when those books used to be cherished so it'll be interesting to see i think i don't think it's a trend that's going to change i think it's only going to get more and more prevalent so i think that's a great pick um a lot like the uh solo series number ones very astute pick for a speculator like mike to pay attention to something like that and notice that that is what's happening and yeah, that's a great pick and great thing to talk about here on the show and with that being said, we're going to roll right into our next cold pick, which comes from Usual Suspects author Peter Renna. This is Peter Renna again, back with my cold pick for this week. And for cold, I am picking Grimjack. 
Now, back at San Diego Comic-Con, when the Russos announced that they might be working on or would like to work on a Grimjack property, uh, everybody got all hot and heavy digging those out of dollar bins from the uh, Grimjack 1 there that I just showed to Star Slayer 10, which I can't seem to find out of my boxes. And uh, as Tover pointed out, Warp 5, which is actually the first cameo in the first of Mundoon's Bar, I believe it is. I mean, if you look real closely, there's another copy of this that I have. I think this is supposed to be him way back here in the corner, just in the shadows. So that's that's really it. But these books now are super cheap again. I mean, there's auctions and buy nows listed. You can get these like about five bucks now. So who knows? If the Russos ever do make this movie, these could be something. But if not, I mean, really what you're buying. Five bucks? I don't know. I think it's worth it. I did it. So, I don't know. There's a chance these could go up. There's a chance could, these could do nothing. But that's why it's a cold pick. It's a buying opportunity. Nobody's talking about them right now. And prices are way down from where they were, you know, just about a month, two months ago. So, uh, that's what I'm saying. Cold pick. Look out for Grimjack. So there we go, Jack. Peter's talking Grimjack. We did see some hype. There was some buzz they are talking about for D23, which seems to be cool right now. I never jumped on the Grimjack train because I just... One of those characters that I wasn't excited about. But either way, there was some buzz for it, and it seems to kind of die down now. But what do you have to say about this, Jack? Yeah, I mean, you know, there's not a lot to talk about with this one, Brian. It's just reality. We talk about it all the time, spec cycle. So it got hot with the announcement. Now there's that lull in between the announcement and when they actually start getting to work on the property, if ever. But, um, you know, so you've seen those prices drop. My hope is if you grab those issues cheap, you flip them during that heat period. Um, if not, you know, you kind of wait till a later date when you can kind of make a move with those um with those issues when you start doing casting announcements or a trailer or something like that um you know i think grimjack uh it's a unique property i don't know how solid i ever felt like that one was yeah, it's like slapstick right <laughs> but that's that's also the nature of the market where and people are so thirsty for speculation kind of news and um and something to invest in that everything that gets announced seems to be reacted to the way that this was and people are going out grabbing those issues and you know people get excited for big spec but i'll tell you my favorite grimjack issue brian is actually grimjack 26 and it has nothing to do with grimjack but that's actually the first color appearance of the teenage mutant ninja turtles and I think that's one of the most undervalued books you can find it in dollar bins. So again, since my man Peter Reyna is the one making this pick, I'll give you a little dollar bin digging tip right there. Grimjack 26, first color appearance of the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles ever. Right. But I also see this one going like Officer Down. There was one that had Spike. There was even a movie made for it. <clears throat> yes. And then <laughs> whatever happened after that, I mean, the book kind of just went out there. And it's got... Good actor, but um, Kim Coates, Kim Cates, yep, yep. Kim Coates from, uh, from Sons, of, Sons of Anarchy. Sons of Anarchy, yeah. Awesome in Sons of Anarchy, and he's got that show on Netflix. I forget the name of that where he's a mobster show on there, but yeah, um, he's like a Canadian mobster. Yeah, but Officer Down. I mean, that kind of reminds me of the type of one thing that's different is you got Russo brothers' name being attached to it, right? So. Right, right, definitely. And there's and there's clout there with the Russo brothers. Another one to think about in comparison is Happy, which I thought was a great show, but um, very limited as far as speculation profits came off of that book. So, so that's why, I mean, I give that example as Officer Down because that's when I was saying what well, Grimjack just didn't do anything for me because I had put it in that same type of category where you get the spec, you get the show or the movie, but then nothing really kind of happens with the book. But... Like I said, I've been wrong before, but I just decided not to put my money in that boat. But great pick from Peter. It is cold right now. And we're going to move into the next cold pick, which comes back again from Comic Man Andy. Hey, everybody. Comic Man Andy, and I'm back with my cold pick for this week. And my cold pick for this week is late print newsstand edition comics. And what do I mean by late print? Um, like a lot of other people, I thought newsstand kind of died in the 90s it didn't just the market share dropped below a threshold that a lot of people weren't seeing it so i think these are ice cold because there's nobody talking about them you never really see them online anywhere they've got to be in bins somewhere and we've got to dig and find them um and what i mean by that is uh 
2000 to 2013, that market share of newsstands went below 10%. Everything else was all direct. And as it went on, as time goes on, it dropped and it dropped and it dropped to 2013 and uh, it got cut back. So look for those newsstand editions. Educate yourself. Get Google out. Look at the difference. You know, you can look at the same comic and they're both going to have barcodes on them. Doesn't mean they're both newsstand anymore. Direct edition has barcodes on them in that time frame. So look for the numbers. Look to see which is which. Uh, Marvel does a really good job saying newsstand on some and direct on others and whatnot. But get your guns out. Educate yourself. Look for these books. Nobody's talking about them. This is ice cold, seriously. And if it's this ice cold right now, prices are going to be cheap. They are not going to be cheap in the future with as rare as these books are. That's my cold pick for this week. Brian Jack, thanks for having me back. What are we going to do? Peace out. Pinky's out. Stay fresh. Ooh wee The beard game is tight with Andy right now. Guess how how they roll up there in the, the bear caves of Michigan. All right, got me feeling some sort of way over here. <laughs> but he's talking about the later newsstands. Um, newsstands in general, yes, I believe. I want to say it's a niche market altogether. Um, you do hear about how much rare, especially the, the earlier newsstands are. He's talking more about the, the more recent newsstand issues, which we've kind of had that discussion before. Um, Barnes & Noble comes to mind where people were hunting those recently. Barnes & Noble recently stopped carrying comic books, if, I, if I'm correct right. Yeah. Um, they still carry trades and stuff like that, but they were carrying single issue newsstand issues. People were hitting those up because they were talking about how rare they believed the newsstands were. And then also what comes to mind with that is those DC combo packs. Remember about three or four years ago when people were talking about how rare the DC combo pack, combo pack books were and how they were doing the math and it was like one and out however so many. But it does seem like both of these have died down now, but there is still a market for them. Don't you say, Jack? Yeah, I, and I think Andy was exactly right when he said the reason why they're cold is mostly because people aren't talking about it. I don't think it's because they're not a smart or wise investment. Um, I think, again, we talked about this multiple times even in the show. There's so many new speculators and new collectors coming in the market. I don't think they're aware. Um, newsstand kind of valuation has been skewed for a while where people, um, they're kind of varying opinions on do, should newsstands go for more. But on the whole, newsstands seem to go for more money at, in key issues. The funny thing about that is newsstands are more prevalent than direct issues when we're talking in the 70s and 80s. So um, they almost shouldn't go for more money with those books. The direct issues should go for more money. Yeah, But, but the Canadian of, price variance is what you want for those. Right. <laughs> a lot of that goes towards the fact that you know newsstand issues were sold at a newsstand. They weren't sold by a comic book dealer who had that love and care for them. They were purchased to be read most of the time. Um and there wasn't the same level of care shown to those kinds of books. So for a newsstand issue to be in good condition for today, and I don't mean good to great, I just mean good in general, um, tends to take a lot. But the value with what Andy's talking about here is less than like 5% of the print run. If we're thinking like the last, I remember the last big major books that were printed with newsstand issues were those rebirth number ones. Um, you're talking about less than five percent of the print run is printed up with, with newsstand editions. Yeah, and I think and, it's harder for people. It was easier for people back then to know tell direct from newsstand apart. Where the newer ones is a little bit harder because barcodes right. were barcodes. It wasn't as easy. I mean, you had to you had to kind of know what you're looking at more. Right, and there was a time. Um, I remember a very short window where this this got hot, um, and there were a lot of people talking about it, and there were people going and buying you know, random issues um, of, like, The Flash. Justice League. Justice League, Batman, and getting almost, like, $100 for a lot of these books. Um, but that bubble burst. And now, because it's not talked about, we see those issues kind of fall by the wayside, and now they're ending up on the cold list because of what Andy's saying, where they're not being talked about. There's almost no premium being paid for them now at current market right now. Um and if there is a premium, it's a very small one, um, not the percentage that it should be. Think about if an incentive variant 
made up just 5% of the print run, We the way we view that. Um, I think it really comes down to the fact that there's not a cover art change. There's nothing sexy about a newsstand. Um, it's just a simple barcode change. So it's not something that collectors really value. I'll tell you a big advocate for these modern newsstands is Topher. Um, he, uh, he has talked about those for years, about the value of those. He's a believer in the long-term spec on those. But it'll be really interesting to see if there ever comes a day again where people start to realize the rarity of those and the desirability of those. And it's definitely harder to spot, like you mentioned, than, say, those DC Universe variants or um, the traditional newsstand versus direct where you had the Spider-Man logo versus the barcode or something like that. So it's something to be on the lookout for. Um, it could come back, but it's definitely cold right now. And I just think, again, like Andy said, it's cold because people aren't talking about it. And it's funny that you mentioned Topher because we haven't really seen him in this video tonight, but that's about to change right now because he's running up our last cold pick and we're talking about true first author, mass speculator, Topher S. Yeah, do we ever really see him? I am the mass speculator, writer of CBSI's True First, supporter of Dan Piercy and Dan Piercy's comics, the construction of a space elevator, and a habitual reader of auto print flaming carrot comics. This week's cold pick, Marvel's Dark Crystal. Comics never cease to shock and amaze me. The new show on Netflix is simply stunning. It's got everything, including a warning on climate change without all the liberal brouhaha. I need a podling. That's all I'm going to say, and I pay an oatmeal too. So why haven't those old Marvel books taken off? You want cold? Marvel Super Special is Sub-Zero cold. It's Mr. Freeze cold. Dare I say it? It's Angelina Jolie cold. Please explain how the Dune books from the same era and same format, magazine and reprinted as comics, are hot and the crystal is cold. Makes no sense. Anywho, Iron Tover out. So I don't even know if that was actually Topher in that video or if that was Ostriker from American Pie because sweet lacrosse stick back there on your door, bro. Either way, there we have Topher with his cold pick. He's talking about the Marvel Dark Crystal books being cold. These have been cold. Every time something Dark Crystal comes out, you think these, book would, these books would pick up some steam. They might nudge just a little bit, but they always kind of remain down there on very, very affordable. The CGC 9.8s, they sometimes garner a higher price. But if you're looking for raw copies, especially, I want to say there weren't even many issues of this, right? Especially the, right. the miniseries based on the books. I think it was one or two issues for the, the miniseries. They had a couple other stories for Marvel. But, uh, yeah, these books are definitely cold. And then a couple weeks ago, we had Andy on here talking about those previous boom Dark Crystal series being cold. I don't know if, as much as we've talked about, I've even talked about how great that Netflix series is, that Dark Crystal. If you haven't checked it out, highly recommend you do so. Will it move the market on any of these older Dark Crystal books? And will it move the market when the newer Age of Resistance Dark Crystal title comes out next month? But what do you think about this pick, Jack? I like this pick. It's definitely cold. I think it's cold, though, for a few different reasons that I think are haven't really been talked about and i think there's some comparables in the market um i look at star wars for this one um look at those dark horse star wars books i think the reality is when a property changes publisher you end up having an effect on those back issues you know very largely um the reality is yeah those those marvel books they may be like the first appearance of dark crystal but i don't think that's what people really care about and I'm, I really expect to see Dark Crystal have its day in the speculation sun because so many people are loving um, the series. It's just being so heavily talked about. Um, it's not like one of those series where some people love it, some people hate it. Basically, everybody who's watched it has given it rave reviews. So, But you're not seeing that Umbrella Academy type spike. No, no. And I think that comes with the more being a Jim Henson property. Yeah. I don't think it's necessarily synonymous with comics versus... Yeah. Umbrella Academy being synonymous with comics. And I think that, that happens with properties like this, um, where it's maybe from some other medium, you know, where it's not really thought of. This is thought of as a movie first, comic book second. Um, so, you know, it's, it's kind of like, it, you know, the new Karate Kid uh, show didn't do anything for the original Karate Kid comics type thing. Like it just, because um, it's always thought of as a movie first. And, uh, 
But I, I think really the investability in this is really going to be the new Boom series. If anything takes off, I think the new Boom series that directly ties in to what we're seeing on screen, let's be honest, I think most of the people who are loving Dark Crystal are new to Dark Crystal. Yeah. I don't think there are a lot of like, you know, people like you or I who we grew up with Dark Crystal. So therefore, for us, it's a nostalgia play. Um, and again, this market gets younger and younger and people are watching Netflix our kids watch Netflix. So, you know, it's one of those things where people get into Netflix, they get into a series, they like it, and then they maybe investigate more. And I and I just really feel like if people want comic books even at all, as it relates to Dark Crystal, they're going to want the ones that depict the characters that they're seeing um, in the show. So I have a feeling that the Boom stuff is going to do better. And I just think even if any of the back issues pop, I would expect the Boom back issues to pop before the marvel ones i think if any marvel one ever pops it'll just be that first issue that one when you can argue that's a first appearance um i think in general i don't think you're going to start to see a run on dark crystal back issues and it's a audience is temperamental man because they like the dark crystal but then you just saw within the news today um they were going to do a jim henson everyone knows jim henson's most famous for the muppets and they were going to do a Disney Plus show with Josh Gad and the Muppets. And that's already been canceled, I saw, as today. They just squashed that, so a lot of people are upset over it. But Yeah, it's, and, it's, and that's kind of the way that stuff goes, where, you know... They've tried to revive the Muppets a bunch of times, though, and it just hasn't... No, there's certain properties, it's funny, to bring back to you and I having kids. Um, how many different properties that we loved as kids, yeah. that we tried to show our kids, and for whatever reason, it just didn't connect? Right. Um, that's the most disappointing thing. If you haven't had kids yet, that's like the most disappointing thing as a parent is when you sit down and you show your kids something and you're like, watch yeah. this. You're going to love it. Yeah. And they say, I know watch. my kids are out of the room and I'm watching GI Joe cartoons by myself. Right. They watch it and they're like, yeah, this is boring. Um, that is soul crushing. Yeah. So when you do get that thing, like for me and my kids, my kids love Ninja Turtles. Yeah. That's like the one thing that connects with them. And then I'm like, okay, cool. They like this. Having said that, they think Transformers is stupid. Yeah. And you know, so that'll get me upset. Or my, my kids think really Transformers are stupid, but they love Rescue Bots. Right. And how ridiculous is that? Yeah. So. <laughs> so. But that's you know that's the way it goes. Um. So, yeah, it, it get, it's tough. So I think Muppets is always going to be something that is going to be tough. The blueprint really is Disney and Mickey Mouse. They never let that property have a down period. Yeah. By never letting that property have a down period, every generation that came up likes Mickey Mouse. We grew up liking Mickey Mouse. Our kids grew up liking Mickey Mouse. And that's the key is you if you go a period of time where you're not on TV and kids aren't you know just used to seeing – that that product everywhere you know i don't even know it's interesting to just bring bring up the muppets i don't even know if my kids are really i wonder if my kids are even aware of Mupp the muppets i'm gonna have to ask them that now because yeah. i don't even i don't even really know if they've seen the muppets like that yeah pigs in space there was a right. um when i was in the military there was a a, a a bar out in fallon nevada that everyone referred to as pigs in space by the way <laughs> <laughs> I'll let other people decide why it was called that, but <laughs> I can only imagine. <laughs> but either way, so that was Topher's cold pick, and that actually is going to bring us to our list this week. And we're going to bring it up on the screen right now. Uh, there we go. So our hot, we have Riri Williams, Batwing, first solo titled series, Tank Girl, Nova, and Boom Studios, and then for cold, we have Run Filler issues. Grimjack, later newsstand comics, and then, of course, Marvel's Dark Crystal comics. What do you think about the list, Jack? I like the list. It's a little short. Um, you know, Definitely probably missing a few picks, but I, I think it is a good depiction of what's going on in the market right now. And I think that what we've been able to do here is show a couple of astute trends, like I said, with the, um, the newer newsstand issues, with the first uh, solo titled series. Those are two definite trends that i think kind of people are overlooking in, in the market um and then this is the rumor the rumor episode because you know three-fourths of the hot list it seems like is based upon rumor and speculation and again that's what we do we're speculators but 
it's amazing the way prices are spiking faster than factual news can actually be had on a property. Right. I definitely wish I had some of the money that these people are spending on some of these books, but that's what we say. Buy what you like, right? Absolutely. Yeah. If you, if you like those Luke Fox books at a hundred dollars, by all means, knock yourself out. I like Luke Fox. I think that's a good book. Um, but I like it at 15 to 20, a lot more than I like it at 50 to hundred. Right. So that wraps up the hot and cold list. Also, tomorrow we will be right back with another premiere of the weekly CBSI Bolo Show where we are covering the hot releases of the week. This show we cover the market trends. The Bolo Show we are actually covering the comic book that had, ugh, the comic books that have released this week by first appearances, reader buzz, and variant buzz. What else do we got, Jack? Well, and of course, we've got the last call show on Friday. Um, that's what we're talking pre-FOC spec. Speculators can get mad at us all they want. We're here for the Simpleman's Comics family. We're trying to give you the earliest opportunity and that, the latest opportunity to get in and get that kind of like guaranteed order, um, barring allocation, of course, with your LCS, with your online comic dealer, with your favorite, as I like to say, comic crack dealer. Um, to get those books and we are only picking a select few in the market that we like um, there's so many it's so tough to make that short list but that is my new favorite show I love looking at it it's purely speculation we don't know what's going to happen in these issues um, we're just giving you an idea of what when Brian and I look at solicitation what we're seeing and what we like and uh, some of them are reader picks some of them are based upon um, possible first appearance buzz or event buzz or variant buzz it, it kind of all ties back into the bolo show so we were trying to give you every area of the market right so with the bolo show last call hot and cold and then of course the weekly picks coming out on sundays if you haven't done so make sure you subscribe so you'll always be notified when those videos are released also want to take time to thank everyone that's been in the chat and thank you for clicking that thumbs up button for us with that being said this has been the hot and cold show and we will see you right here during the live premiere tomorrow night at 9 p.m eastern thank you so much guys <laughs> <laughs>